will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive me and forgive us. We pause for a moment of silent confession before our God. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have never offended you, and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful me. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a call and ordained servant of the word, announce God's grace to all of you. And in the stand and by the command of my Lord Jesus, I do forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together today the words of the intro and found printed on the insert in your bulletin.
First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the Gospel of our Lord. of 
very common, hopefully non-Lutheran tactic of outreach to ask somebody, if you were to die today, would you go to heaven? So suppose you were asked that question. Suppose somebody comes up to you this week and asks you that question. If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? What would your answer be? Yes. Yeah, good. Hopefully your Lutheran brain kicks in at that moment. And your immediate answer is yes. That's a good answer. And we're going to get back to that in, in just a little while. But you see, that tactic is used from a misunderstanding of how God works, from a, a wrong theology. That the reason that question is asked is to, to imply, to implant in the person's mind that they haven't done something, or they haven't done enough something to somehow earn that, that minimum entry fee of getting into heaven. And once more, hopefully, your Lutheran brain kicked in just then and said, well, Pastor, of course that's not how it works. As the game show says, good answer. There are only two truthful answers when it comes to salvation. One is indeed based on the law. And one is based on gospel. Now, there's no doubt. Absolutely no doubt that God has set down His law. You heard it read to you again this morning what we call the Ten Commandments. But people will often ask the question, does God have a right? Does God have the right to lay down His laws and to expect us to follow them? That's a good answer. I like that. Well, what is God saying before he gives us those Ten Commandments? Did you catch it? Look at your readings if you want to check this out. He says to the people, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of slavery. So again, he does. He's God. We are his creatures. And that's enough. But really, my friends, there's more to it. Did you notice? Did you catch it? It was kind of subtle if you're kind of focusing on the Ten Commandments part and you missed it. Even here, for us, in God's giving to his people his Ten Commandments, gospel and salvation come first. And then the law after. You see, God has already brought the Israelites out of slavery. He has brought them out of their slavery in Egypt. He has brought them into the freedom of being his children and under his headship. And he did it by his own power. While they whined and complained about not having enough straw and having to get it themselves. While they did absolutely nothing about it. While they gave Moses, the guy who got called to take them, out of slavery, while they were giving Moses a hard time, God was doing everything. He saved them. He brought them out of slavery. And then he gives them his law. It was then and it is now. As it has always been and it always will be, the law follows being saved. We do not follow God's law to be saved. We follow God's law out of gratitude because we have been saved. God is in essence in that Old Testament reading telling his people this. I saved you. I had saved you from slavery, slavery in Egypt, slavery from all of that evil that you were under to be placed under me but my friends, my children, there is still a long road to go. If I saved you out of that, you can kind of trust that I have your best interest in mind. And now that I have given you my law, know this, I have your best in mind. I have given you these laws, not to save you, I have given you these laws to guide you, to guide you in this life 
to show you what it means to be my child. I've given you these laws to keep you safe. I've given you these laws so that you can have a good relationship with one another and to keep you in your freedom until I get you home to the promised land. Like I said, as it was then, it is now, always has been, always will be, God saved you. God saved you out of the slavery of sin. And you, just like we sang in that hymn a moment ago, you and I, we contributed nothing. Absolutely nothing. It was the Father's will to save you because you are His dearly loved child. It was the Son's work to save you by Him going to the cross, that word of the cross that we heard about last Sunday, everything He did for your salvation. And it is the Holy Spirit's work and means of word and sacrament to deliver to you that salvation. See, it's all a God thing, and that's exactly now what our epistle was about. By the Father's will, by the means of the Holy Spirit, through word and water in your baptism, you and your sins are dead and buried with Jesus in that tomb. And they are gone forever. They were buried through water and word. You were drowned and you rose up as a new person. You arose to new life in Christ. And now, now, baptized child of God, you are clothed in Christ. The death he died was the death that you and I deserved. It was our death penalty for our sin. And Jesus Christ paid it in full. And so, like God is saying in that Old Testament lesson, God is saying that he does for you the exact same thing in your baptism. Because in our baptism, we are connected to the death of Jesus Christ. Do you hear that? In our baptism, we are connected. We are united to the death of Jesus. And what did Jesus die for? Your sins. So Paul writes, for one who has died, we have been set free from sin. Now we're going to continue to sin. That's are as all a human being, but we have been set free by Jesus from the consequences, from the hellfire, because of our sin. By God's will, by God's work, by God's means alone, you have been set free. Set free from sin. Just like those Israelites, though, we still have a long way to go. Until God gets us home. So Paul tells us, you must also consider yourselves dead to sin, alive to God in Christ. By the death and resurrection of Jesus, by the Spirit's chosen means of word and sacrament, God is essentially saying to you now, I saved you. I saved you from the slavery to sin. But there is still a long way ahead for you in this world. Since I saved you, you can know that I love you. I care for you. I did everything for you so you can trust me now. And here is my law. This law is not to save you. You know that. This law is here to guide you through this world. To show you what it means to be a child of God in this world, how to live the life that he has given you. These laws are there to keep you safe. These laws are there to, to show you how to have a proper relationship, a good, God-pleasing relationship with all the other people in the world. And these laws have been given to you to keep you in your freedom until you get home, until you get to heaven, Till we all live together in the new creation. That's God's very simple plan. Gospel and law. You know what? 
Satan hates that plan. He really does. And sin corrupted human beings, they will look at that plan and it says, it's just too simple. It can't be that simple. There must be more. There must be some way I can prove to God that I am worthy of what he did for me. Hopefully, again, your little brain just kicked in and said, that is a really awful plan. That is a bad answer. You're right. Now, God did give the Ten Commandments. And the scribes and the Pharisees, as we know from history, they added another 600 laws and rules and commandments on top of that. And back in Jesus' day, these scribes and Pharisees might have come up to the average Joe on the road and said, if you were to die to heaven, and die today, would you go to heaven? The difference was, these guys had a scorecard. And they could check it off. Have you done this? Have you done that? Have you done this? Where's that tenth of your cumin? Right? They're looking for all of that stuff. See, the problem was, was in their eyes, you had to be good. You had to be really good. You have to be super good. You have to be as good as them. And not only do you have to follow all that stuff, you know, they might just make something else up as they went along. You see, their plan was this. Law first. Salvation, me. God's plan is this. Salvation first. Forgiveness in Christ. Done away with. 
for that means no longer be in sin. God says to you, baptized child of God, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery and sin. I did it because I will to do it. Because you're my child and I love you. I did it by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and by his resurrection from the dead. I did it by claiming you as my own child and making you an heir of heaven by my means, by my grace, by my gift through faith in Jesus Christ, which I gave to you. So we go back to that scorecard of Jesus. Unless your righteousness Seeds that are described as the Pharisees. Well, I have wonderful news for you. You have the exceeding righteousness you need because it's given to you as a gift from God because it is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. For our sake, the Father made Jesus to be our sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? Absolutely. It's a done deal in Christ Jesus. Are you going today? Perhaps. We don't know. Probably not. So in the meantime, Paul tells us, consider yourselves dead to sin for the life of God in Christ. And you know what? You don't even have to figure out how to do that. How to live your life as a saved child of God. Well, we've got the Ten Commandments. Great things for us to follow. God's Word. But, remember this. God has given us this law not to save us, but to follow us for our good because we're sinning. Look at how Jesus ends the gospel today, and I think this is a really good place for us to start. Don't be angry with your brother. Just start there. Do not be angry with your brother and your sister, with your fellow man. Instead, be reconciled. Be reconciled to them through your repentance and their forgiveness. You know, that sounds to me like a really good song for me, for you, and for this whole world. But I tell you, we really need it now. So one last time. We do not follow God's law to be saved. That's already done by God. By grace, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. No, we follow the law because we have been saved. And we know that it is God's good will for us to help us lead a peaceable life in this world until God decides to call us to that world to come. And so that your days may be long in the land that your Lord is giving you here in heaven, and in the new creation to come. We will, I guarantee you, we will enter into the kingdom of heaven because our righteousness does exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees because we have been robed in the exceeding righteousness of Jesus Christ, our Savior, in our baptism, and in this holy gift of His grace. And in thanksgiving, Say to God about that. Amen. Please. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated at this time. I ask that you register your attendance in the past at the end of your pew, even as our offerings are collected. Along with prayers listed in your bulletin, we've had these two special prayer requests for Lenny McCain, who is still not doing well in her recovery from her spider bite. And we also pray for Body Stone. Body Stone, his tin 
Ms. Smith's mother. She suffered a massive stroke on Monday, has been in the hospital this entire time. She has been deteriorating, and the effects on her brain is causing many, many problems. And uh, so we pray also for Tim and Renee as they continue to help care for her while she is in the hospital. Let us rise now as we lift our prayers and praise to God our Father. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, whose perfect righteousness covers our sin, and whose innocent suffering and death frees us from the prison of everlasting death. Lord, in your mercy. Your Heavenly Father, you have purchased us from the power of sin, death, and the devil through the waters of holy baptism and made us your children. Grant that we may count ourselves to be dead to sin and alive to you in Christ Jesus, serving our neighbors in love and looking for the resurrection that is ours in your Son. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. O Lord, you gave the law that we might know your will and live as your holy people. Increase in us true fear, love, and trust in your saving word and your holy name, that we may have no other gods but you. Guide and bless all fathers and mothers, pastors and teachers, as they bring up children in the discipline and knowledge of the true faith. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord God, protect and direct all pastors and missionaries, including our pastors, John Jenkins and Carl Beckwith, and our missionaries, the Lawson and Federwood's families. That they will all be faithful in their sharing of the true gospel to the world. That those who are lost in the darkness of sin and false hope, may come to the assurance of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Uphold and direct by and to your will all elected and appointed officials in human government, and guide and protect all who serve in our armed forces. Grant peace graciously, O Lord, in our time, for there is no other who fights for us but you only, O Lord our God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are in need today, for Cindy and Charlie, for Terry and Marcia, for Lord and Steve, for Caroline and Wesley, for our homebound Francis and Pam, for Carl and Norma, Linda and Sandra and Howard, for those who we lift up especially before you, for Bonnie and for Tim and Renee, for Lenny, for all of those that we now lift up before you in our hearts. For all who are in danger, poverty, sickness, necessity, and temptation. Here also for all of those who are persecuted for the sake of your holy name. Comfort them with your spirit, that in all this they may recognize your fatherly will and finally be rescued by your grace. Lord, in your mercy. In your Lord God, you desire not the death of sinner, but rather that we would turn from this evil way and live. We flee to you for your mercy in Christ Jesus. Grant that we may ever thus believe and never waver. Grant that in such faith we may worthily go to your altar to receive the very body and true blood of your Son that has been given to us for our redemption, that we may ever pray, serve, and honor you and your Son. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our and Lord God, Heavenly Father, we confess that we are poor, miserable sinners with no good in us. Our hearts and our flesh and blood are so corrupted by sin that we are never in this life without sinful desires. Therefore, we implore you, forgive us our sins. Let your Holy Spirit so cleanse our hearts that we may love your word, abide by it, and by your grace be saved forever. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue now with the service of the sacrament, beginning on page 194. The Lord be with you.
tonight, dear, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us with the same in faith toward you and a fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Thank you.